purpose. You are our Savior and our God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. So last week, we finally started getting into the petitions after we had a few gaps between each lesson. Now, we've, now we're on to the second petition. So last week, we looked at that first petition. Our Father in Heaven, which was the address we looked at first, and then hallowed be thy name. Yep. And we looked at everything that's behind the name. Nancy, you probably remember one of the people I brought up in that introduction. Yeah, Lord Voldemort, right? Like that, but that's like a good illustration how in the books of Harry Potter, they weren't even afraid to say, they were afraid to even say his name because there's a lot behind a name. There seems to be almost a sense of power behind a name. Of course, that's fiction, but we believe that today too. When we listed off all these different names and how a name represents everyone, everything someone is and who they are. And so when we're praying, God, hallowed be your name. We're asking him to be who he is, our savior God to us. And when we were also praying that we then uphold who he is in our action, in our lives, as we reflect his love, as we reflect who he is to others. And so now the second petition is somewhat related in that thy kingdom come. We're asking for God to now do those things that he is to bring us our salvation. And we'll dig more into what is all behind thy kingdom come. I don't know about you, but thy kingdom come was one of the more confusing petitions for me growing up. I, I always didn't really know what that one meant. And so let's talk about what pops into your mind when you hear the word kingdom. So how about just that word separated from the Lord's Prayer? What's the first thing that pops into your head when you hear kingdom? Your thoughts? England? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Any others? Rapunzel. Rapunzel, yeah, in her ca castle, letting down in her hair, yeah. Place where king rules, king down. Mm -hmm. Yep, there you go. You got that that word king right in there because it kind of is a given that there's going to be a monarch, king or a queen. Any other thoughts? I think these days, current culture and television and video games and all those things have kind of made kingdom kind of people think of it that way like they're think of the, the shows that have been so popular right, recently like a game of thrones or all these medieval video games that young people are playing and everybody's playing and, and you kind of think yeah there's these battles there's these kings going after each other but in a kingdom there's also a way of life a way of a hierarchy of things, right? Maybe a, a setup of, I don't know, serfs and lords that have to follow in. There might be knights, things like that. But otherwise, there's a, there's a system of laws within each kingdom, right? So that's a, one other thing I wanted to note about that. So then let's move on to this prayer. What comes to mind when you think of God's kingdom? First thing that pops in your head. Yeah. Heaven. Yes. That's what I thought of right away. God's kingdom. Think of heaven. Anything else that pops into your head when you hear God's kingdom? It's like a trick question. You, you think I'm doing a trick question? I <laughs> well, I got to see where you're at. I got to see where you're at. <laughs> yeah. Perfection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we would think. We think of how the kingdoms of the world we talked about had so many failures and once ro rose and once fall, rise and fall constantly, but God's kingdom is perfect. Other thoughts? God's kingdom. Eternal. eternal. Mm -hmm. Kind of a connection of maybe to heaven a little bit, the eternal life will get to be in God's kingdom. What about now? God's kingdom. Why do we pray thy kingdom come now? Church, yeah, church is a place where we go and we experience God's kingdom to us. Yeah, so I think your answers kind of revealed what I used to kind of think a little more too. And it's not wrong that God's kingdom includes heaven. That's true. Um, God's kingdom is certainly included in heaven and we see there a perfect bliss of his kingdom. That's where we get to see without eyes of faith, but with our two eyes, how amazing and full of bliss and glory his kingdom is. But this petition actually is so much more even than that and for right now. And we're going to get into that, what we're praying when we say thy kingdom come. Because first, we'll get right into it. There's a kingdom outside of God's 
kingdom right now. And we're going to look at what that is and who is its ruler. So I actually have some names already up here because I like almost never had to read last week, right? <laughs> I don't even think, do we even get to you? I don't even know. <laughs> so Alex isn't here, but do you mind if I keep your name up there, Nancy? Clarice, do you mind if I keep your name up there? All right. Anybody else willing to read today? Thank you, Greg. I'll put you first. All right. Anybody else? Nick, thank you. Anybody else? Pastor, you're not gonna you're not gonna you know raise your hand all the time. You guys have an opportunity. <laughs> I'm putting them up there. Keep putting me, keep putting me up there my first week, so I gotta put them up there. <laughs> awesome. All right, five. Let's do that. All right, so let's dig into that. So in order to set some context, I know I've told you this is a study of the Psalms and the Lord's Prayer connection. But we're going to look at a little more New Testament than we have the last few weeks to give us a fuller understanding. And then we'll dig into the Psalms to sort of see the truths we looked at in the New Testament first. So John 12, verses 31 to 36. And then 12, 12 31 is kind of the key passage here. Is someone willing to read that for us? 12, 31 to 36. All right. Thank you, Greg. Take your time. I'm getting there, too. Now is the time for judgment on this world, and the prince of the world will be driven out. And I will, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He says this to show the kind of death. <coughs> the crowd spoke up, we have heard from the law of the Messiah, who will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? So Jesus told them, you're going to have to <coughs> have the light just a little bit longer. Walk while you have the light, because darkness overtakes you. Whoever talks, walks in the dark, does not know where they're going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so you may become the children of the light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Thank you, Greg. So yeah, the key verse he read right away was it said, Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. <laughs> So what does this tell you about that kingdom outside of God's kingdom? Or that first question, who is it ruled by? Here's one of his titles in that second half of the verse. Yeah, this is Satan, the prince of this world. That's one of his titles Jesus gives him. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And then in the rest of what Greg read, we kind of see this light and darkness thing. It talks about how the people then in that kingdom, under the, the, the prince of this world, are in darkness and unable to see that light. The light needs to shine so they can see it. So those who are outside of God's kingdom, not believers, are under this ruler, the prince of this world. So now let's see what that other passage has to show us. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we'll, we'll, the key verse here is chapter 4, verse 4. With some, let's see. Nancy, were you willing to read that? 4, 3 to 6? And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let the light shine out of darkness, make his light shine in our hearts, to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Thank you, Nancy. So we see in that kingdom, the first thing she wrote, or she read was, even as the gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. So in those outside of God's kingdom, outside of his family of believers, there's a veil. They can't see that glory. And then this key verse came, that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers 
so that they cannot see the light of the gospel. So we see that light and darkness coming out. Now it's Paul telling us about this and not John. And so now we can kind of see the goal of this kingdom that's outside of God, God's kingdom. And that's right here, that he has blinded the minds. He wants people not to see the gospel. This kingdom is an enemy to the kingdom of God. But we see what the solution is against that. And the rest of what Nancy read, we see that this is why, this is what Paul is saying, for what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. So that's the answer. Lost and in this darkness of the kingdom of this world, where the prince, and here he has another title, right? God, Paul calls him the God of this age, little g, God of this, this age, is trying to pull us away. But God's light shines into the darkness. He's quoting Isaiah there. It's a prophecy. And so now we can see that it's a miracle that we were brought out of that kingdom into a far more glorious kingdom now. Not later, not a heaven later, but now we get to take part in this kingdom. So we'll look at Christ's kingdom and read Colossians 1, 13 to 14, and then we'll jump two chapters ahead in Colossians to 3, 15 through 16. All right, who's up here? All right, Mitch, go ahead. Thank you. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So there we see light and darkness again, often terms used by, the, by God's apostles to describe this between the kingdoms battle that's going on. But here we see again that solution and why Christ's kingdom is different. You saw the key words here. He said, and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. And now we'll jump to Colossians 3, verses 15 to 16. Because as you can see by this question, we, however, are planted in the new kingdom. So we should see that as a miracle because without Jesus shining into our hearts, without that light shining into the darkness, we would be lost and unable to see. Think of how thick darkness you can't even see the palm of your hand in front of your face. That's where we would be. But poking around in the dark, unless that light was shined into the darkness. And so we are implanted in a new kingdom, or should we say that kingdom is implanted in us? So let's see what Colossians 3, 15 to 16 has to say. Clarice, do you have it? Yes. Thank you. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as in teach and admonish, uh, and another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs with the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Thank you. So there you see it. This heart came up twice. She just finished singing it, singing it about the gratitude we have in our heart, but earlier she said, Let the peace of Christ. Rule in your hearts. So that's where this new kingdom is. It's, we can't see it with our physical eyes, but God, in giving us faith, gives us the eyes of faith to see that Christ is ruling in our hearts. And so that's why I worded it like this, that we are in a new kingdom, but that kingdom is also in us. The Bible describes Christ here as the ruler of our hearts. And so that's the key question that we will wrestle with today is what is ruling our heart? Because as Christ rules our hearts, that then flows into these other things we just saw as Clarice kept, kept reading. We saw that it, we use the word of God to teach and admonish one another, to sing psalms, hymns, and songs, because we're singing from that gratitude that's in our hearts because Jesus is ruling our hearts. So I think that's some background that, can, that we can establish as we move forward now in connecting thy kingdom come with the Psalms and how we see that come out in the Psalms. 
So there was a way that the writers of, the, of our catechism said this, and I thought they, they put it well. This is what they wrote. They said, who or what is in charge of your life? Many things want to control what you do, think, and, and see, and do. The love for material wealth wants to control your decisions. A love for pleasure wants to dictate what you do. Yes, the sinful nature is eager to rule your heart so that you serve only yourself. And so then the second petition is a prayer asking God to help against those desires, to be he the one who controls our hearts rather than those desires. And so when we pray, we want his kingdom to come. We're saying our desires to be God's desires. It's like Pastor will talk about in the sermon today, for those of you who weren't here yet, and those who heard it, saying we're conforming our will with God's will. The more we read his word, the more we, that rule is established in our hearts and we pray as God would have us pray, asking his desires to be ours. So how does God's kingdom come? Martin Luther puts this in his, what does this mean of his, of the second petition? I'll let Pastor read this one. <laughs> how does God's kingdom come? God's kingdom comes when our Heavenly Father gives His Holy Spirit to by His grace to believe His Holy Word and lead a godly life now on earth and forever. Awesome. So there we see that little summary of how it then enters our hearts, how Jesus comes. It's through His Word. And we're going to see that come out. And, and Mark 1.15 makes this clear. This is my turn now. The time has come, Jesus said. The kingdom have, of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The context of this is Jesus going from town to town, preaching the good news. So how does this kingdom come? It comes through his word, preached, taught, read, and it establishes Christ in our hearts. That is the kingdom of God, and that is the kingdom of God we are a part of, the kingdom of God that is implanted in us. So let's dig in. Thy kingdom come as we see it in the Psalms. So first, we're setting up this battle between the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of this world. And we'll see if this is a fair fight. So the way we'll do this is we'll, we'll kind of just look at each part together and work through this. And we'll go back and forth from the one side to the other. And then we'll see how this battle plays out. So we'll start with Psalm 17. So we're going to be in the Psalms again and pretty much the rest of the way. So we'll jump back to the top of our reading list, if that's all right with you, Greg. We'll start with Psalm 17. We're going to verse 8 to 15. That's right. Keep me in the apple of your eye. I hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who are out to destroy me, from your mortal enemies who surround me. They close up their cow's hearts and their mouths speak with arrogance. They have tracked me down. They have surrounded me with eyes of earth to throw me to the ground. They are like a lion hunted for prey and fierce lion crouching in cover. <clears throat> Raise up, rise up, Lord, confront them, bring them down. With your sword, rescue me from the wicked. By your hand, save me from the such people, Lord. For those of the world whose reward is this life. May you have stored up for the wicked, fill their bellies. May their children gorge themselves on them, and may their leftovers for their little ones. <clears throat> As for me, and I will be vindicated and will see your face. When I awake, I will be satisfied seeing your likeness. Thank you, Greg. So the key question on what we just read is, what does this kingdom desperately want? We see it. In the second verse, and then, and then especially as we go forward in this section, what does this kingdom desperately want? This was the key verse. Thoughts. So the they here is referring to that kingdom outside of God's people, the enemies the psalmist is talking about that surround him. And what do, you, what do we see their goal? Taking away from the Lord. Yeah, 
They want to pull us away desperately from that kingdom, to throw us to the ground. And so we see God's, the prayer of the second petition come out in this. He's saying, keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Keep me protected in your kingdom because these wicked are out to destroy me. And they speak with this arrogance. They surround me. And then another really strong picture he gives is like a lion hungry for prey, a fierce lion crouching in cover. And so then here comes a thy kingdom come prayer. He says, rise up, Lord, confront them, bring them down with your sword, rescue me from the wicked. So since the kingdom of this world is constantly trying to pull us away from God, when we pray thy kingdom come, we're asking God to protect us, hide us in the shadow of his wings and protect us from those enemies who desperately want to destroy believers. So now we'll jump to the other side. So we see the kingdom of this world desperately wants to destroy those who have God's kingdom. But yet we see the utter difference it is for those who are in God's kingdom. So we'll jump to the very start of the Psalms, the very first Psalm. Let's see, Nancy, this is yours. Go ahead. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. So we see utter differences between the sides. Did you catch any of those comparisons? Here's one verse that talks about how it is for us. This was the last verse. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Did anyone catch some of the, the word pictures the psalmist used to describe that? He said the righteous, those who meditate on the law, are like... Tree. Like a tree planted by streams of water. I don't know about you, but it's pretty hard to just go and push down a tree. I worked on grounds crew at the Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, and there were sometimes these tiny trees we would try to take out. And sometimes the guys and I, we would try to take it down without a chainsaw to save some time. So we would like try to just tackle this tree out of the ground. But even a skinny tree, as thick as probably my fists, it wasn't very easy for three guys to just tackle it out of the ground. In fact, we failed. We, we very badly failed. We got bruises and all of those things. So we imagine this tree planted by streams of water. And this is a picture of that, that river that flows through God's kingdom of heaven, right? So this river of life. That's what we are planted by. We are sturdy. And then this strong, strong comparison. The wicked then are like chaff. Chaff is that excess dust as they would on the, on the uh, grinding floor of the wheat that would fly up and get in your lungs and go off with the breeze. That is what the wicked are like. And so is this a fair fight? Like I said on the sheet above this, well, we already see in our first comparison anything, but having God's kingdom, we are strong like a tree while the wicked are like chaff blown by the breezes of this world. And we can see that as troubles arise, where is their hope? Where is their grounding? There is none. But for us, we know, we, we know the God who controls all things and what hope we have. And so the kingdom of this world seeks to destroy us. But we are like trees planted by streams of water. So we'll move on to Psalm 53, the first three verses. Mitch, would you be willing to take that for us? The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. And their ways are vital. There is, there is no one who does good. God looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. Everyone is turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. So some strong words that answer this question. So I'll let... <clears throat> I'll let David's words answer this one. Can those in this kingdom please God in any way? 
everyone has turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. If we were not part of God's kingdom, if Christ is not ruling our hearts, we cannot please God. Without God, we cannot be pleasing to him. We are covered in sin. God cannot be in the presence of sin. But Christ has covered our sin. He has forgiven our sin. Those are different pictures we have in the Psalms. Of He's removed our transgressions as far as the east is from the west. We'll get to that when we get to the fifth petition. And so we can please God now with our new life. But those who are still outside of that kingdom cannot please God. Because God will only see this, that all have become corrupt. There's no one who does good. And that first verse said that same thing. They're, they say there is no God. And so, of course, that is foolish, it says. And so they cannot do good before God. But let's see how, how it's different in the kingdom of God. And so now we're going to dive in to one of our strongest prophecies. I said throughout this study, we're gonna be seeing the connections of the Psalms to Christ. So today we're gonna to be seeing two of those most quoted Psalms in the New Testament. And this first one is Psalm two. So Clarice, I'll have you read that one. So just the next page over from what, where we were just reading a moment ago in Psalm one. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs and the Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king, O Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son today, and I have, I have become your father. Thank you, Grace. So something I should have mentioned before when we read Psalm 53 about no one who's done good, that reveals, just a, a quick aside, that reveals why we pray this for ourselves. I don't want this part of the study to make us think, oh yeah, this petition is not, yeah, the world, it needs your kingdom to come, Lord. It's so messed up. Everybody out there is so distant from you. And, and wow, you need to let your kingdom come on these people, either destroy them or, or, or fix their lives. No, we pray this prayer first and foremost for us because we would realize where we would be without God, without his grace, without Jesus ruling our hearts. We would be in the same place, unable to please God. And we would have God against us like we see here in Psalm 2. So what was God's reaction to the futile efforts of the world's kingdom? Did you catch it in this, in this psalm? They said, why do the nations plot against me and the earth rise up? Why do they band together? I'll let the psalm answer it. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. The efforts of the kingdom of this world are, are so weak against our almighty God. This isn't some light versus dark manichaeism that, where there's this good and evil, some people like to say in the world, and they're kind of an equal power, always fighting. No, no, our God is far beyond the kingdom of this world. He is all powerful. And so we see him saying, no, I laugh because I have a far better plan because now we see a prophecy of the king who is coming. Because verse 2726 said, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. And then the psalmist writes, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today, I have become your father. So this is a verse from, from I believe this is Acts 4. We see um, 425 to 31. And this is kind of a key verse from that. He says, indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. So here we see in a sermon by Peter that Pontius Pilate and Herod were a fulfillment of this psalm. The nations coming together, plotting against our King Jesus. But that was never going to be able 
to bring down God's kingdom, even though they thought they were by killing Jesus. That's a good place to turn, in fact. We'll be going to Acts. So let's, let's turn to Acts 4 and show you the context of this. And we see this prophecy fulfilled. I think we're up to pastor, actually. Pastor, if you don't mind, if you could read Acts 25 to 31. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, my father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? And the kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his mighty one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Thank you. So there you see it. He quotes Psalm 2. And we see what we just heard when Clarice read that for us, that the nations are plotting against him. And so Peter says, indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together, and they wanted to kill your servant Jesus, whom God had anointed as his king. And so the Lord considered that he's asking them, the Lord kingdom come prayer in verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. So there we see that thing that Martin Luther was getting to in his, in his explanation. How, how does his kingdom come? Well, it comes through his holy word. And so in response to these nations who conspire against Jesus and against his apostles, he's saying, God, give me the strength and great boldness, the end of verse 29. Stretch out your hands and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And God answered that prayer. The place where they were meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God boldly so that the kingdom of God could come to all those who were listening. And so that's where we see our first big prophecy of Psalm 2. But there's a lot more where that came from. So let's take a moment and split off into groups and look at these other four passages. So Matthew 3 through Hebrews 5 there. And so we'll kind of go in the four quadrants of the room. And Peter, you can feel free to grab as any of them that you want. Or feel free to do all of them if you have time. So we'll go in four corners here. Greg and Dale, if you don't mind going with Mitch and Greg up here, then that'll be one group. Although otherwise, we'll have the... You three, I'll kind of join with you, you know, since you're just three. And then five back here. And then you can pass it to you. I should have you. I should have you. Yep, so front left corner, why don't you take Matthew 3? Okay. And then this back corner, I'll have you guys look at Matthew, or Acts 13, 32 to 33. So now you're going to see Paul preaching instead of Peter. And then you guys have Hebrews 1, 5. And look at the context of these two. We're going to see what, what argument the writers are making. And then Hebrews 5 up here. Once again, kind of see the context around verse 5 as well. And I'll give you, this is a shorter one, so I'll give you three to four minutes-ish. You got to look at the context a little bit, Nancy. Connected to where it's in Psalm 2. Nancy just did a great job. She said, oh, where, where's this in Psalm 2? So you should see a prophecy fulfilled in what you're reading. So in Psalm 2, verse 7, is that the Lord's Um, 
All right, one more minute. <laughs> All right. For you guys, we're so the yours like kind of moves on from the kingly picture and brings it into like a priestly kind of picture. So kind of expanding the thought of Psalm 2. Verse 7. That's all right. That's all right. All right. Awesome. Sounds like the conversation kind of got up. Perfect. I had three seconds left on here. So, yeah. Do we need the air back on? Yes. It was really cold in here when we first walked in, but all you people are just bringing the heat in. All right. Go. We're good. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. I was noticing that too. I don't know why I didn't change it. All right. So, Lots of lots of places this psalm is fulfilled. And if you think this is a lot, just wait till we get to the next page and look at Psalm 110. So we were seeing how Jesus is in the Psalms. Remember, that was the whole point of this study is when we pray the Psalms, we're praying with Jesus. And we see it's almost like Jesus is speaking Psalm 2. Because and through through David, right? Because David was his great ancestor, and Jesus was his descendant. Sometimes he's called the son of David. And so we see Jesus speaking through Psalm 2, and now we see that fulfilled in Matthew 3. So Matthew 3, this was your key verse. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. What was the context of that? Um, Psalms verse 7. Yeah, so that one's quoting verse 7. And then what, was, what events of Jesus' life? God's son. Mm -hmm. But what, I'm sorry, I'm asking, when was this announcement made? Did you guys catch it? Yeah, Jesus' baptism. His announcement that this is my son. And like you said, yeah, we see that in Psalm 2, verse 7. And that was probably what uh, quite a few of yours quoted, right? Because that was kind of the key verse, that he's installed his king. And so this, many people call his baptism like his anointing or his coronation day. Psalm 2 is really a coronation psalm saying that I've installed my king. At that time, it was King David, but now it's King Jesus. And so we see it as baptism. You are my son, verse 7 of Psalm 2. Okay, Acts 13. This was your key verse for those who didn't get to read it. We tell you the good news. What God has promised our ancestors, he's fulfilled. What was the context of this one? Did you catch it? What was kind of Peter getting across, or Paul kind of getting across in this? Or once again, you saw verse 7 quoted. That's what you saw. You saw, you, you are my son. Once again, Paul is quoting that. But did you see what Paul is doing right before those verses that you read? How he's kind of working through the whole history of salvation, right? He talks about how all of it culminated in Christ. He starts with Abraham and then suddenly he's moving on to how it's fulfilled in Christ. And then he shows how that was done. The second Psalm was a prediction of this. You are my son. Today I've become your father. So here his connection is more to the resurrection than Jesus' baptism. We see in the Matthew 1, it was his baptism when God made that announcement. He made a similar announcement at Jesus' transfiguration. When he showed his true power to those three disciples, he said, you are my son, 
whom I love. And now we're seeing in Paul's preaching that by raising up Jesus, he's talking about raising him from the dead, his resurrection. He was shown again to be God's son. You are my son. Today I've become your father. Hebrews 1 in this corner. What did you guys find? Yeah, there it is again. The New Testament writers and their inspiration loved this psalm, so clearly pointing to Jesus. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I've become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. So yeah, what was that whole argument about? You kind of see it at the beginning of this verse, but. Uh, I was saying that Jesus is superior to the angels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all talking about Jesus' superiority. So we see that kind of king theme coming out again that this psalm brought out, that he is the ultimate king. He's the Messiah, our king. And he's even greater than the angels. The Hebrews is kind of fighting this, these false teachings that some people kind of Gnostic theology, for those who are familiar with that, it's just people were trying to say that Jesus was another great prophet or angel, but the writer of the Hebrews is showing how Jesus was far better and far more important than any angels or prophets or priests. Speaking of priests, Hebrews 5, 5, what did you find in that one? The same. same thing again. So in this exercise, I wanted to show you that, how key this passage is, that this is messianic, pointing to Christ. The Psalms pointed to Christ. So this is from Hebrews 5, 5. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, Okay, Siri, <laughs> you are my son. Today I have become your father. Please have a seat. Yeah. <laughs> She's always interrupting me, honestly. So yeah, and so that whole section, what did you find was, was the argument from the writer of the Hebrews? Really what you said, right? Yeah. yeah. It's just, he is my son and... I am, I am his father. Mm -hmm. It all goes through him to me. Yeah, and it was that writer of the Hebrews, and we'll get to it further, just saying that he was greater than any other priest. And we'll see why when we explore Hebrews 7. So the thy kingdom come prayer in Psalm 2 is clearly that last verse then when he said, or that verse 6, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. God has anointed Jesus, his king. He proclaimed it multiple times, quoting verse 7, that he's my son. And so we know that he is our, the true son of God, the king in whom God is pleased. We see, in whom I am well pleased. So we can do no good before God outside of that kingdom, but within God's kingdom, the one who rules our hearts is pleasing to God. We heard it from God himself, in whom I am well pleased. And so covered with Christ and his righteousness and him ruling in our hearts, we too are pleasing to God. So then we'll jump back to this kingdom and I'll keep it moving a little bit so we can get to the next exercise. Can those outside of the kingdom speak to the Lord as we have the privilege to do? So today we're talking all about prayer. But this is 1841. They cried for help, but there was no one to save them. The Lord, but he did not answer. No. God does not answer those outside the kingdom. Prayer is a special privilege for believers, those who are a part of God's kingdom. And so we should thank God for that. And so when we pray thy kingdom come, we also pray for the world to hear the good news. That's why Paul preached when he quoted this psalm, right? That you are my son. It's why the writer of the Hebrews is making his point that Jesus is greater than angels. Jesus is greater than the prophets. Jesus is greater than the priests. It's so that people can hear that word, the good news, and it can impact their hearts too, so that Jesus can rule their hearts. And when we pray this, we're hoping that more people then can be brought into God's kingdom and also enjoy this privilege of prayer. So let's read Psalm 18, 6 to 15. And this is my turn now, so I'll read it out for us. Psalm 18. Verses 6 to 15. It says, In my distress, I called to the Lord for help. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. 
my cry came before him into his ears. The earth trembled and quaked. The foundations of the mountains shook. They trembled because he was angry. Smoke rose from his nostrils. Consuming fire came from his mouth. Burning coals blazed out of it. And then I'm going to jump ahead. So we see, as you kind of skim through that, we just see his great power. How there is this canopy around him. There's this brightness. And then jumping back to verse 13. The Lord thundered from heaven. The voice of the Most High resounded. He shot his arrows and scattered the enemy. With great bolts of lightning, he routed them. And then I'll jump to the final verse 16. Or no, verse 15. The valleys of the sea were exposed and the foundations of the earth laid bare at your rebuke, Lord, at the blast of breath from your nostrils. So I read it like that to really bring out the content here. What do we see revealed from this battle? It's that God hears us and he fights for us. And we certainly have the more powerful king. What could the prince of this world, as he was called by Jesus, do against this kind of power? This psalm brings it out in such strong language, the power of God, that smoke from his nostrils, the trembling of the earth, the lightning, the arrows scattering the enemies. We are on the winning side. I shouldn't even say winning. We are on the side that has won. Victorious King Jesus is who rules the kingdom that we get to have citizenship in. So they cannot pray to God. But just like this psalmist did in verse 6, when he said, In my distress, I call to the Lord, and he heard my voice. So God hears us, and he fights for us. So as you can see, not a very fair battle. God's kingdom is the far stronger side and the most and all-powerful side. So that final side on our side, it says, the gods know nothing, they understand nothing, they walk about in darkness, all the foundations of the earth are shaken. We would understand nothing unless God had enlightened our hearts and Jesus had come into it. They don't understand true wisdom. So we're part of God's kingdom. We're soldiers in his kingdom, part of this kingdom. So what role do we play in the battle? We saw our all-powerful God and his arrows, but there, maybe there's something we must do. This is Psalm 44, 6 to 8 is the key. But I'll put it right on the screen for you. It says, I put no trust in my bow. My sword does not bring me victory. But you give us victory over our enemies. You put our adversaries to shame. In God, we make our boast all day long. And we will praise your name forever. So what role do we play in this battle? None. Nothing. It's God who fights. And we see this imagery elsewhere, right? In Exodus 14, 14, before Moses split the Red Sea, while God allowed him to lift his staff and split the Red Sea for Israel's deliverance from Egypt, he prays when they were complaining and worried, the Israelites, he said, the Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. And we think one of those powerful sections of scripture, Ephesians 6, God says, put on the full armor of God. Armor is meant to protect us. There's Exodus 14. And then he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Notice it doesn't say so that you can run headlong into battle. No, the imagery of Ephesians 6 is us standing behind God, protected. Armor is a protecting thing. God has put us in his heavenly armor to protect us from the attacks and he fights for us. So we don't pray this prayer saying, Lord, fix all the problems out there or let us fight them. No, we recognize we need defense or we would be part of that kingdom out there. But by God's grace and his care, we are part of his kingdom. And so when we pray this petition, we ask that he, it's, it says vengeance is the Lord's and deliverance is his too. And so we let it be in his hands. And so time is flying by. Uh, thank you for bearing with me today. This has been a, a lot of content in today's because thy kingdom come is just so, we see these kingly psalms just constantly throughout the psalms. So we've got a lot to go through. So I'll take you through this focus psalm, Psalm 110, a little quicker so that we can end with looking at the victorious way of life we live. So this is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. 
by a lot. There are over 33 quotations, or I think it is exactly 33 quotations or allusions to Psalm 110 in the New Testament. And so if that's the case, and this is a kingly psalm, I think this is the one for us to look at today. So why don't we have someone read that for us? It's already on your sheet. Greg, would you be willing to read Psalm 110 for us? Yes. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at the right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will accept your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing of the, on the day of battle, arrayed in holy splendor. Your young men will come to to you like dew from the morning's womb. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of my feet of that. The Lord is at your right hand and he will crush kings on the day of the wrath. He will judge the nations deep enough on the dead and crush the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from the brook along the way and so he will lift his head high. All right. So that right column I've put there for you to see these incredible connections to the New Testament. First, the Lord says to my Lord. In the Hebrew, this is a special word, ne'am, which means utterance. This speaks to the inspiration of David as he writes this psalm. So it literally, quite literally from the Hebrew, it says, the utterance of the Lord. So David is not saying his words here. He's saying what the Lord says to him. And then it says, the Lord says to my Lord. Kind of an interesting phrase that Jesus explains in Matthew 22. Um, Nancy, are you able to read that from the screen? While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? And it says after this that the Pharisees went away unable to say anything else. Because he had shown them how this pointed to the Messiah, this psalm. And, and the, even the Pharisees of that time, the religious leaders, they saw this psalm as messianic, pointing to the Messiah. And so they're telling him that he's the son of David. And they thought it would just be like this great descendant that would bring them deliverance, an earthly kingdom. But Jesus is showing them that, no, this Messiah is going to be far greater than just a descendant of David, but his Lord, his Savior from sin and death. And so that's what we see here in Matthew 22. And then Ephesians, we see this is now, I put it in purple so you can see what hands it, or what, what part of Psalm 110 it connects to. Sit at my right hand. Well, Ephesians says this, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. So as you see in that title above this section, our victorious kingdom is ruled by a victorious king. Right now, he is sitting there above all power, all rule, all dominion. That's who our king is. What a wonderful kingdom to have. What a wonderful king to have ruling in our hearts, too. So Christ is seated at the right hand. We see that part fulfilled in the New Testament. Now moving on to the green. You see, until I make your enemies a footstool under your feet. Here it's quoted by Peter in his big Pentecost sermon. You see the quote right here. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool under your feet. And so he says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. So in a powerful way, he's letting the law work on them. That even though this was the king of all creation, even though he was God's king, he, they crucified him. But yet even him who was crucified was risen again and now placed on his throne and is still ruling there today. So we see it quoted there. It's quoted again in the great chapter of the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15. And a beautiful, beautiful chapter about the hope of the resurrection we have. A wonderful chapter to read, especially lately as we've lost our sister Carolyn in this life. But she is enjoying the glories of heaven with her Savior. 
And he quotes this again. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. See that in the psalm in the green? The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. So not only enemies, not only the prince of this world, but also death. He is our king even over death. And he has crushed death under his feet. This psalm, and like I said, 33 times this psalm is quoted in the New Testament to show us what Jesus has done as our king. And now the big one is Hebrews 7, Christ as our priest. So in Hebrews 7, I won't go into it today. This is maybe a great thing to look at this week at home, profound chapter. We see in this psalm, he's described as the prince of peace. Melchizedek, when he says you're a priest in the order of Melchizedek, Melchizedek was this mysterious figure who Abraham ran into in Genesis. <clears throat> and he was a priest of God Most High. But we don't hear what his lineage was. We don't really know where he was from, other than that he believed in God and he was a priest of God Most High. Well, his name meant King of Peace. Well, we know Jesus is the Prince of Peace. So we see he's a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Then Hebrews goes on to tell us, he was without lineage. Like I said, we don't know where he was from. Well, Hebrews connects that. Jesus is without beginning or end. Hebrews 7 tells us that he was greater than Abraham because Abraham paid to him a tithe. This mysterious figure of Melchizedek. Probably Old Testament believers wondered, what, what was this? It didn't, didn't seem to make sense until they saw this psalm. Until Jesus showed them through the writer to Hebrews that this was to show how he was going to be a great priest as well. So he's greater than everyone. And then in verse 17 comes the quote. So this is Hebrews 7, verse 17. He quotes Psalm 2, 4. It says, you are a priest forever. Or Psalm 110, 4. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So we see he is a priest forever. So in what ways is Jesus our priest? First one might be obvious. Just as... A priest would have to constantly give sacrifices in the Old Testament to atone for the sins of Israel because one was never enough. You had to constantly keep going. Jesus gave himself as the ultimate sacrifice. He was our great high priest when he did that so that all sacrifices could stop. But notice how it says he is a priest forever. Priests also represented God's people. They had to be of God's people, so they had to be in the Old Testament of the tribe of Levi, so they could represent all of Israel before God. Well, Jesus became human, one with us, so he could represent us before God. And that's how he's a priest forever, because he lives to intercede for us. This is Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. So that means he is constantly at the throne of God the Father saying, I atone for their sins. I said it was finished. Their guilt is no longer. Their sin is no more. You must bring them to heaven. Bring them to me. That is what is behind that word, intercede for us. He is our priest forever. So he was our priest with his sacrifice and he is still our priest as he represents us. And I think I failed to get us to this next section in time. But just some last thoughts to end today then on Psalm 110. We'll pick up how this changes our life next time because I think it's too important. Or if you'd like to look at it throughout the week. But first to just wrap up Psalm 110. Like I said, the most quoted Psalm by far. And if David, the greatest king of Israel, calls Messiah his Lord, then the Messiah must be more than just a descendant of David right? He must be the true God. And since Christ has defeated all our enemies, he's brought us into his kingdom through the proclamation of what he's done. And so his kingdom continually comes to us today. You guys heard his word now in class. You heard it in the church or some of you might. That's God's kingdom coming. That's him answering that petition. So we're hearing what Christ has done. And through that word, he works in our hearts and rules our hearts. And so because we know that, 
that leads to a victorious way of life that we don't have time to look at today. But we'll close with prayer then as we see how that affects us. This prayer is based on Psalm 18. The Lord lives. Praise be to you, our rock. May you be exalted, O God, our Savior. You are God who avenges us, who has subdued our enemies. You have exalted us and saved us from our enemies. You have defeated sin, death, and the devil for us. Therefore, we will praise you among the nations. O Lord, we will sing praises to your name, for you have given us the victory through our King Jesus, and through him you have blessed us with your kingdom forever. Amen. Okay, so for those of you who might work through that this week, this was already obviously such a chock full lesson, but I couldn't even fit in all the amazing Psalms that connect to the kingdom and God, Messiah, our King. So if you want to look at three other really, really key ones, you should write on the bottom of your page if you want. Psalm 17 is a huge one, talks about what a sure defense we have in God. Psalm 24 is a psalm of prophecy for Palm Sunday. We, it's the Palm Sunday song. We see Jesus, our King. It says, who is the King of glory? The Lord God Almighty. And then Psalm 57 is a classic psalm of deliverance from our King, the Messiah. So those are some extra ones for you to enjoy and personal study throughout the week. All right, God's blessings as you go about your week. Those of you who are heading out, and I'll see the rest of you in that worship.